so let me just start with a very basic question. Why did you write this book? What is the genesis of this project? What compelled you after so many decades of reporting to focus in on the story of Latinos in the United States? The simple and unromantic answer is that uh, the producers of the television show came to me and said, would you like to write the book? <laughs> and I, I said yes. Um, okay, but the well, more, the more the complicated, question, the, the, the better answer, though, uh, is that I wanted to write a book like this for a long time. And I think the stars aligned in a way after the 2010 census that made this a more plausible project for all the different stakeholders. It was the genesis of the television show. It was why Penguin was looking for a property of this kind. Uh, it was why uh, there was the reception that it got in the marketplace, why there was an interest in having this, why uh, Penguin, which is part of an enormous publishing conglomerate with Pearson, which is one of the major scholastic book sellers in the country, has an army of salespeople out there trying to get this book into school. So uh, it's really an idea whose time arrived, and I just got to be the lucky guy. There are a lot of writers who could have done a similar project and done a good job with it. Uh, I'm just grateful that they asked me. Well, I think they went to the right person. What, what is it that the 2010 census told us about about the Latino community po population in the United States. Uh, Mark Hugo Lopez, a friend of mine, the numbers guy at Pew Hispanic, said they had an office poll because they released the Latino numbers three states per month as they started to finally tabulate all these numbers. And they started an office pool because this is what numbers geeks do. They have a, an office pool about where the number will finally arrive. But in the early months, they began to notice that every group of state results that came in, everyone from every region of the country, was higher than anybody at the office had guessed about where the numbers would be. And they started to realize, once about 30 states were in, that this was going to be a much bigger deal than anybody had realized. Only one person in the office pool guessed a number that began with five. And when it came in, when the 51st result was reported, because obviously with the District of Columbia, uh, there's 51 r results that have to be stated, uh, it came in at 50.5 million, one out of every six Americans, and that was really a stunning number. A stunning number that in its bigness um, hides a lot as much as it reveals, but we can talk about that uh, as we go on. That number, I think, uh, made a lot of people sit up and take notice. But also the state results that showed 750,000 in Virginia, um, 750,000 in Georgia, 600,000 in Alabama. Alabama? Really? This is no longer a coastal and border state phenomenon. It hasn't been for a while, but now this really put the, the definitive stamp that something really big and nationwide was happening. Now, I want to talk over the course of our discussion today, and, and we will bring in your comments after we speak a bit on your questions. I, I want to cover politics. I want to cover the dimension of foreign policy, culture. But since you, you just put your finger on a, a, a critically important dimension of the story, which is that there are people who identify as Latinos living in every state of the Union plus the district, is that the, the, the reason why the issue of immigration has become so acutely uh, uh, tense and uh, cause for such partisan dispute? What is the relationship between the politics of the immigration issue and the ubiquity of the Latino community in the country? I don't choose to see America as uh a cruel and ungenerous place. I think it's current economic trends that scare people and give them pause. If you look back at 1998, 1999, 2000, when we were creating jobs month after month in the hundreds of thousands, and the most marginal members of the workforce were getting jobs. Um, 
the, uh, the shortages of labor in discrete markets around the country were finally forcing up the hourly wages of even the most marginally skilled people. Nobody, <coughs> nobody complained about this much. Uh, you just didn't hear this stuff that you hear now about immigrants and their, their role in the economy and their role in the country. I think bad times have made this a more fraught conversation than it was before. But also the uh, multi-regional nature of it. It used to be an argument mm -hmm. that other people got to have. And the Dakotas and mid, mid uh, the Great Plains states, they just, they, were, they had a vote on it, but they weren't necessarily the big players. That day is over too. Everybody's got skin in the game now. And the, um, the political trajectory of this conversation is uh, depending on your your own orientation, uh, either sadly or reassuringly following the trajectory of lots of other debates in our society right now. Well, let, let's go back in history a little bit to a character that we saw in the clip, and then I'll ask you to tie it to, to a dimension of history unfolding just down the street on the mall. Uh, we saw Dolores Huerta uh, in her um, campaign um, in the 1960s say, we are here. and. Dolores Huerta, of course, and Cesar Chavez were essential in the 1960s um, uh, campaigning in California. And um, they had the political support of Bobby Kennedy. Can you tell that story and, and tell us how it relates to what we're seeing on the mall today with a hunger strike in which Eliseo Medina, and please tell us who he is, is uh, now in, I think, his 20th day of a hunger strike along with others. Um, striking for uh, the U.S. Congress to take up the immigration issue seriously, especially in the House of Representatives. And we saw President Obama the other day go and visit with, with the hunger strikers. The parallels between that moment and that moment in 1968, are they, are they, is this a good historic parallel, a bad one, imperfect? What does it tell us? Yeah, I mean, well, look, I think Huerta and Chavez are two of the unfairly underknown people in the history of the 20th century uh, in this country. The contemporary troubles with the UFW shouldn't obscure the fact that what they did at the time in the fields in the 1960s was revolutionary. They said that contingent labor, America's peasants, deserved to be paid enough money to live on. And we heard Cesar Chavez briefly when he said that if you sit down to a meal, you've participated in the exploitation of another human being. That's a scathing critique of American, the American economy, uh, but one that was sort of lost in everything else that was going on in the, the tumult of the, of the 60s. Huerta, college educated, a public school teacher, uh, Born legal, parents legal, American for many generations. Chavez of more recent tenure in the United States, but from a successful, I guess if you want to give it a Marxian analysis, you call them petty bourgeois, a successful family that lost everything in the Depression uh, and were reduced to following the crops and following the seasons in the fields after they lost their, uh, their store, their bar, their garage, they lost it all. In the, in the worst of the Great Depression. Uh, Chavez joins the Navy, uh, comes back, becomes an organizer. And just the very idea that these workers, of all workers, could have a union and demand an hourly wage, clean water, proper working conditions, shelter when you're out in the fields all day. We, we may or accept this notionally in 2013, but in 1965 and 1967, it was really hard for people to think that these workers of all workers should, should get those things as a matter of course. So there were killings. There were beatings. It wasn't some polite uh, set of negotiations around a table. And the lead negotiator for the UFW was Dolores Huerta. Uh, Cesar became the public face of the movement, uh, led the pilgrimage to Sacramento, 
uh, walking right behind the banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Uh, this guy, uh, for a lot of people, it was the first time they had ever seen a Mexican stand up for anything in a way that they couldn't be made to back down and made to um, you know, tip their cap and bow and, and back out of the room. Uh, it's hard in, in 50 years later to remember what a big deal this was there. And Dolores was the architect of the boycott strategy. She took the campaign for a UFW national by doing organizing in the big cities east of the Mississippi, which was a critical um, juncture for the movement. They realized that if it stayed in the Imperial Valley, in the San Joaquin Valley, no one would know who they were, no one would know what was going on, and no one would know what a war this was. And she understood that you had to go to big media markets, and you had to go to the places where people buy the things that we pick in order to get another group of Americans engaged in this struggle. And we can, we can talk amongst ourselves about whether that is a kind of easy threshold activism, not eating grapes or not eating lettuce, but it was tremendously effective. And we weren't allowed to eat grapes or lettuce my entire childhood. I don't think I ate a green grape until I was 25. Well, <laughs> that was a brilliant master stroke in, in political organizing and making people feel that they are part of someone else's struggle, even if they're pushing a, a shopping cart through a Gristides on the Upper West Side, uh, they were part of the struggle in Fresno. They were part of the struggle in Delano. It was, it was really smart. And they also engaged the rest of the labor movement, which was a very important thing, because the Teamsters wanted to organize the fields, too. And it wasn't like the Teamsters in those days. Let's remember, this is 1967. We're not pushovers who said, oh, oh, you got the fields? Oh, OK. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just stick with the truckers then, no problem. Um, but Cesar Chavez also was against the easy movement of unemployed men, mostly men, across the border of the United States from Mexico. And when the government would not close the borders, UFW activists were at the border pushing people back into Mexico. For some people, this was a betrayal for which they can never forgive him. But he said, I'm not a Mexican leader. I'm a labor leader. And the presence of these men as an exploitable, contingent workforce makes it possible to oppress my members. And it makes it impossible for us to defend the notion of an hourly wage for them. Again, a little bit of family fight that if you talk to people both in labor and talk to people who are activists in Latino circles, there's, there's always a renegotiation of Cesar Chavez. One of their young organizers was Eliseo Medina. He was a, an important uh, field organizer and had been a field worker. Uh, in the Southwest. Today, as a very young boy, as, as a young fella, and, and then as a young adult, mm -hmm. became one of the, the leaders in organizing. Today, Eliseo is, is striking on the mall. He's also the highest ranking Latino labor leader in the United States, the International Vice President of the Service Employees International Union, which is right across DuPont Circle. <coughs> and for every misinformed columnist who snarkily notes that organized labor is against immigration reform. Uh, the Teamsters in the form of Rich Trumka and, uh, uh, not the Teamsters, the FL-CIO in the form of Rich Trumka and others, uh, Eliseo Medina and the leadership of the SEIU, uh, the big locals across the country, they make a lie out of that accusation every day by really being in immigrants' corners. My sister-in-law, uh, does legal advice for, uh, for justice for janitors in New York. She's employed by SEIU. And these are they're the, the peasants of today. These are the people who uh, mop hallways and carry garbage cans and, and do the work that keeps a place like Manhattan going. And uh, 
if, if the SEIU was anti-immigrant, they, they would all be deported by now. So, so the, the SEIU of today would actually have disagreed with the UFW or Chavez's right, of, border of position of the, of the 1960s. Right. Well, what they didn't want, and because what the growers were doing to bust the union was to simply um, take buses down to um, Nogales and Tijuana and Tecate and, other, and, and Ciudad Juarez, fill them up and just come rolling across the border with a wink from the U.S. authorities at the border. Uh, that was what Chavez, Chavez knew he couldn't have a union if that was allowed to just continue unabated. Uh, but it was also important for him to say he's not a Mexican leader, he's, yes, a, he's a labor leader. That's a an Im really important distinction because duality and split loyalties and questions about who are you really run like a thread through this whole book and this whole story from the very earliest days. And the lady we saw complaining to a television reporter about how they never learn English and they always want to speak Spanish was in Florida, the place where Spanish was spoken longer than any place else in the continental United States, practically, uh, far longer than that relative newcomer, English. Now, uh, so. now Huerta and Chavez are obviously far more well known than some of the other his figures that you have uh, told your readers and viewers about. Who are, who are the, the people in this story that, that most strike you as both compelling and unknown? Well, um, Juan Seguin, who was a captain in the Texas Army of Independence, fighting to free Texas from Mexico. He led the only Spanish-speaking regiment in the Texas Army and was the only Spanish-speaking senator in the Senate of the new Republic of Texas. All his speeches as a senator are recorded in the archive, had to be translated out loud in the moment. Uh, they didn't have earphones uh, in Austin that you could uh, listen on, but his speeches to his fellow senators were uh, simultaneously translated. But his loyalties were questioned, and eventually um, what really was the program of the uh, Southern American Anglo settlers of Texas became apparent, which was to not only settle there, uh, but to push out Mexicans, especially Mexicans who owned land, and, um, and institute slavery in their new republic. They wanted to bring Texas into the North American plantation system, and they did. And once again, now in his memoirs, uh, describes himself as a man with no country, moves to Mexico where because he had taken up arms against the Republic of Mexico in order to free Texas, was also viewed with great suspicion uh, and, and doubts of his loyalty to Mexico. Uh, he dies uh, broken, his family split between two countries, impoverished. Uh, his body is only brought back to the United States for burial late in the 20th century, and he rests in the town that now bears his name, Seguin, Texas. But when you read his diaries, you see a guy trying to wrestle with what he was and what he is and what he and his progeny are going to be. And sort of working it out on paper in his anguish about the doubts that he was committed to Texas, for instance. Uh, he writes very bitterly about the way night riders come and burn down barns and knock down fences of Mexican small holding farmers because they don't want to have their lands broken up and incorporated to plant cotton and rice and indigo and, and other crops. So once again is a, is a tragic but instructive figure from the early years of the encounter between the basically Spanish West and Southwest and the expanding United States. Um, another interesting story uh, and one that even comes as news to a lot of Puerto Ricans, is of Isabel Gonzalez, who is the plaintiff in the first personal case that goes to the Supreme Court on the status of Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rico was an accident. Puerto Rico, f without much planning and much forethought, fell into Uncle Sam's lap. 
the Spanish-American War was really about Cuba. It was never about Puerto Rico. But there, when the war's over, there's Puerto Rico and 1.1 million Puerto Ricans. And immediately, American agricultural interests rush to Washington to have it defined and codified in law what Puerto Rican sugar, Puerto Rican coffee, bananas, pineapples, how will they be treated? Are they imports? Uh, are they exports? Are they just like growing a rutabaga in Arkansas and putting it on a, on a cart and sending it next door to Missouri? Or is there something different about what is being produced in Puerto Rico? They were in such a rush to define stuff that they never defined people. And er, into the early years of the 20th century, it was totally soft clay in law who and what Puerto Ricans were. Were they the citizens of another country? Well, not quite, because the Stars and Stripes flew over San Juan, and there was an American-appointed governor who lived there. Uh, were they citizens of Spain? No, the Queen Regent of Spain, because her son was only 10 or 11 years old, signed a treaty with Americans that said, that's it, we're done, we're out. But they weren't Americans either. And Isabel Gonzalez, a couple of months pregnant, gets on a boat in San Juan Harbor to sail to New York to marry her fiance, who's living in Staten Island. She gets there, and as with every boat that comes to that part of the world, two people get on board, a customs inspector and an immigration inspector, because the boat had also been to Caracas and Havana and, and Santo Domingo. So they send all the foreigners to Ellis Island, and Isabel Gonzalez says, oh, I'm not going to Ellis Island. <laughs> I'm Puerto Rican, so I'm an American, so I'm just coming, and I'm going to go see my fiance, and we're going to get married. And they said, oh, no, you're an immigrant, like, any, like somebody coming from Venezuela or somebody coming from Cuba, because Puerto Ricans aren't American citizens. She goes to Ellis Island is held in the infirmary there because she's pregnant. The immigration inspector of New York Harbor, a man named William Williams, uh, basically rules that she is in danger of becoming a public charge because she's not yet married. But of course, she can't get ashore to marry her fiance. She does eventually. They pull strings inside the small Puerto Rican emigre community that exists at that time in New York, which is the hangover from the revolutionary organizing that went on in New York throughout the late 19th century, trying to get independence for Puerto Rico. They're still there. They get her out. She marries the fiance. The case is moot, but she's so pissed off <laughs> that. Encabronada. Right. Showing that some things about Puerto Ricans never change. Uh, that she continues with the case and goes all the way to the Supreme Court, Gonzalez versus Williams, and wins the right for Puerto Ricans. The Supreme Court rules that, of course, because they come from an American held territory, they can move to the mainland. Um, this is a story almost lost to history, really. Uh, people have told me, I've never heard of this woman. This is great. It's very interesting. Um, she settles down in New Jersey. What year was the lawsuit? Uh, 1903. She settles down in New Jersey and becomes a letter writer to the New York Times. <laughs> so the 1920s and 30s are filled with angry letters from Isabel Gonzalez <laughs> about this or that outrage that Uncle Sam is visiting on her home island which only goes to show you that you know, once you get pulled into this thing, uh, you sometimes can keep a lifetime interest. Her descendants are now scattered all over the United States, and uh, her great-granddaughter kindly gave me a picture that I could use in the book. Uh, Macario Garcia, who we saw briefly, uh, the first Mexican-born man to win the Medal of Honor uh, for <coughs> valor in battle. Uh, comes home to Sugarland, Texas, in South Texas, outside Houston, goes to a cafe, uh, and they refuse to serve him there because he's Mexican. And he loses it, um, beats up the cafe owner's son, and punches the cafe owner, a woman, in the jaw, um, is thrown through the window. I mean, it's a big deal. Um, 
And it starts to slowly, you can't keep something like this in Sugar Land, apparently. If someone wins the Congressional Medal of Honor and then gets in a brawl in a cafe because they can't get service, uh, it eventually gets found out. But the case really didn't take off until one Walter Winchell used it as a report in his program, which was the most listened to radio program uh, that was a non-drama, non-music program, the most listened to um, news and information program in the United States at that time, became a big, big deal. Uh, Garcia today has a school named after him, a fort named after him. Um, it is uh, one of those stories that you just think, he's sitting there in uniform, because he, the War Department made him go on tour, so he was speaking at all these civic organizations and all that. He's sitting there in the, with the decoration on and all that, and he can't get service, which is a reminder, and it should be a reminder to all Americans that while we think of the struggle for civil rights largely because of the way it's been portrayed and because of where the big battles were as a black-white thing, uh, and we just recently we've been marking the 50th anniversary of uh, the March on Washington, and the, the great speeches that were given at that time, and of course the coming anniversaries of the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, housing, fair housing laws, if you were west of Houston, there was still apartheid in America then too, but it wasn't a black-white thing because there were very few blacks in the, in the greater west and specifically in the southwest, but many of those same indignities and legal barriers were visited on Mexicans for over a century. Um, separate school systems, separate sewerage and garbage collection, separate street maintenance and repair, so you knew when you crossed from the Anglo part of town into the Mexican part of town immediately because suddenly the streets weren't paved. There were spigots on corners. Uh, there, were, there was open sewerage, that kind of thing. And th that existed. And everybody spoke about schools and Mexican schools. You can hear people refer to it today, older people in Arizona and, and Southern California. The Mendez versus Westminster case that went to the Supreme Court was the precursor of Brown versus the Board of Education. Again, not very much talked about, but it was that the legal theories behind Mendez that inspired Thurgood Marshall in the structuring of his argument in Brown when he was the head of litigation for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So it's important to remember that Latinos have been on parallel roads going to the same place for a long time, not being granted by matter of right or by virtue of citizenship the same set of privileges that everybody else is granted as a matter of course. They needed to fight for every inch of ground. They needed to struggle over and over again to pull down that uh, parallel school system to stop the uh, uh, mapping of things like county seats so that in a majority Mexican-American county, none of the county commissioners were Mexicans. I mean, even in, even in, in border counties in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, they would take Mexican neighborhoods and carve them up into five dif different districts. Or if the voting totals were close enough, have everybody elected at large so no Mexican could win any offices. La Raza Unida Party, the Brown Berets, start to organize in the Southwest and really change that story. That makes up a lot of this book. That reminder that it's not some separate history about some separate people, but all our history, this history belongs to all of you no matter where you came from or where your forebears came from in the world, and just as your history belongs to them as well. Even Lyndon Johnson's awakening to civil rights and racial inequalities is born when he was a teacher in South Texas of Mexican children. When Lyndon he Johnson worked taught at, at a Mexican at, When he directed the National Youth Administration for FDR in the 1930s in Austin, where many of the young people that he was trying to help in getting jobs and housing were Mexican. 
that's where his civil rights consciousness starts as a young man. And he cites that when he speaks to a joint session of Congress at the time of the, his signing, ceremonial signing of the Civil Rights Acts. He says that this began for him when he was a teacher at a Mexican school and he looked into his kids' eyes and knew that they knew that their country didn't care about them and he never wanted that to happen to any other kids. So you know, it's a, a big part of our shared history, but I think one that for many reasons uh, we talk about less often than the much better covered much more written about, much more talked about struggle in Montgomery and Selma and, and Birmingham. Well, you are changing that with this, with this book and with your series. And I want to go to a much more covered uh, dimension of the story. You mentioned it a couple of times, but let's talk about Cuba just a little bit. Cubans living in the United States and the diaspora um, have formed a very big part of the foreign policy debate as it relates to U.S. policy toward Cuba. Um, of course, I could say more about why that is, but the issue that I want to get to is to ask you to talk about why, at least superficially, it seems that Cubans have a much more significant voice and passion and involvement in the formulation of foreign policy toward Cuba than do Mexicans or Salvadorans or Colombians or Venezuelans. What, what, why the difference and, 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 and do you think that might change? Um, yeah, I think, but it will change not become, because Cubans become less involved, but because other Latinos become more involved in the home issues of their, their own home countries and the countries of their ancestors. Uh, when bread and butter issues dominate the uh, political maturation of any community, uh, it's not, there's going to be very little time left over for militating around policy that has to do with Mexico or the Dominican Republic or, or so on. So Cubans uh, were able to do that for what reason? Because they came when the Cold War was reaching its fever pitch because they came as political refugees rather than people seeking economic opportunity, and because they came uh, largely or disproportionately compared to other communities from the economic and social elite of their country, which gave them a different footing almost from the beginning. Yes, Cubans speak very movingly and with every justification of doubling and tripling up in crummy apartments in Hialeah and so on, when they first got here. Accountants and dent dentists and doctors uh, working as cab drivers and busboys and dishwashers. And yes, they worked very hard to get over. But there is such a thing as social capital, and they came with it already living between their ears, and it served them very well. Also, they came to a place that was about to zoom economically. And yes, they helped contribute to the zoom, but also Florida was about to really take off because America was changing. And I sometimes, and some other historians who've written about it, sometimes wonder how different the Puerto Rican trajectory in the United States might have been had they gone somewhere else besides New York, uh, a city that was mm -hmm. at, its, at the absolute zenith of its commercial and cultural power when they got there, but uh, like the top of the cyclone in Coney Island, uh, they were about to take a, quite a significant and shocking turn, and Puerto Ricans rode New York down uh, for the next 30 years in a way that Cubans didn't really have to worry about uh, in Florida, which was growing smartly and becoming a new economic powerhouse for the United States. Uh, 20 years ago, when the United States and Mexico negotiated the NAFTA, ag the NAFTA agreement, we heard a lot of speculation at the time, and the question was asked then, well, you know, this is something that the Mexican elite and the American elite seem to want, but is this something that Mexicans in the United States want? Now, 20 years ago, I, I think I remember hearing, well, you know, in another generation, you're going to see that Mexicans and other non-Cuban Latino communities here are going to be very much more involved in formulating and pushing for certain policies towards their sending countries. Um, we haven't seen that yet. Yeah, but I think um, 
the large numbers of Mexicans that retain the vote in the United States, uh, Mexican candidates for president often campaign north of the border and make appearances and speeches and lead the news back home on Televisa and Azteca mm -hmm, TV mm -hmm. because they're campaigning in Chicago and Los Angeles and Dallas. There's a growing trans-border political consciousness, I think. Uh, and on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of NAFTA, set your calendars, January 1st, 2014, uh, when it takes effect, uh, we can You'll have- you be anchoring the show at We'll have corn-based yeah. parties at all our houses. Um, <laughs> I think there'll be more of an occasion to talk about what NAFTA has wrought, and there'll be more Latino voices in the mix. It won't just be an elite conversation, or at least on Al Jazeera America. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the end of your book, and then I, I want to, you're, you're free to, to, to pipe in here, but I want to bring the, the participants in the room into the conversation talks about the identity of young Latinos and Latinas who are here. Some of them are dreamers. Some of them are here um, with the full uh, benefit of uh, legal papers, some not. Um, we do have a transformation happening on the cultural level in this country where we see bilingual television commercials. We see um, Fusion TV, which is uh, developed for a, a bicultural, bilingual, Hispanic viewer. Um, Culturally, you know, I, you don't have to be on the coast to see a McDonald's ad that's in Spanish. Uh, and that's just a very f superficial take. So project out sort of a generation, not on the issue of foreign policy, but on the issue of national identity. Given the percentage, the, the rates of the growth rate of the Latino population in the United States, which is also faster than that of the Anglo population faster than that of the African American population, given the sort of more uh, cultural um, osmosis that I think is becoming ex increasingly comfortable in the oxygen that we breathe. What, where do you see uh, this conversation happening 20 years from now? What does it look like and who's participating in it? Well, uh, you will have, I think, a parallel experience to what we saw among black Americans when the walls of the ghetto were pulled down, uh, both in, in legal terms and in, in cultural practice, where the, uh, on the streets of the old ghetto, uh, you could have a, a garbage man, a minister, an insurance salesman, and a foreman at the post office all living on the same block. Once the walls of the ghetto were pulled down, um, communities that had high rates of poverty became more and more concentrated as areas in, in poverty. And a kid was less likely in 1975 than he was in 1955 <coughs> to grow up around different plausible models of success and plausible models of getting over in America. If you were poor, you were much more likely, if you were a black kid, to grow up only around poor people and if you were middle class, you were far more likely only to grow up around other middle class people. I think there will be a similar stratification among Latinos. I think we're seeing it already. Um, mm. And also, uh, because this is the first large ethnic group that is also mixed race, there's going to be a different dimension to that as well. And we'll see. I mean, it's hard to say right now in 2013 where that takes us. If Latinos subvert the American way of race up until now, uh, then we'll see all kinds of people, as dark as Celia Cruz and as light as Jennifer Lopez, uh, making their way into all different levels of society. But if uh, there's a pigmentocratic view and, and uh, Latinos play the game instead of subverting the game, then we may have a, de -stratific a stratification that, uh, that falls along pigment lines in a way that should be uncomfortable to us, but we see it already. Uh, they marry out at much higher rates than other American groups of similar size and similar makeup. Um, I did. You did. Uh, so, um, but, 
uh, that out marriage, and I don't have good stats to back this up, but I'm sure I could get them, uh, is something that's experienced just as moving to the suburbs, just as um, a lot of other markers of getting a leg up in America um, fall along color lines as well. If you're a very dark Dominican, mm -hmm. you're probably not as likely to marry out as, uh, as a very, very pale Mexican. Again, speculation on my part, but uh, also you'll be noticed in the suburb if you're one kind of person as opposed to the other. So uh, it really remains to be seen when, when the demographers say there'll be 130 million Latinos in 2040 in this country, it remains to be seen what that really means. Are they people who um, have some dim and ill-defined association to another place in the world, or people with an active, conscious attachment to a heritage? Mm -hmm. that's, that's really an open question. Uh, when I was interviewing a German guy, German-American guy, uh, named Heise, he was farming the last farm in Cook County, Illinois. So my assignment was to go out there and profile him because it was almost time to take in the corn. And then after that, they were going to build a subdivision on the last farm in Cook County. So I go out there and I pass a Heisa Avenue on my way out to this remote part of Cook County from Chicago. So I get there and I say, hi, how you doing? NBC, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I just passed Heisa Avenue. Is that your family? And he says, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think uh, we got here in like the, uh, the 1850s. So I said, from where? And he said, um, Germany, I guess. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, what an interesting answer. Germany, I guess. Because it wasn't a big part of this guy's life whether it was Germany or Austria or the Western German-speaking provinces of Czechoslovakia or Silesia and southern Poland. It didn't matter. His name was Heise or just Heis, and they had an avenue, and you know he thinks that that was some remote grandparent. But I, I had a, a rough moment on the way back in the car going back to downtown Chicago when I thought about some person in 2075 saying, oh, I, I, I don't know, Puerto Rico, I guess. And I was like, ooh. ooh. <laughs> but of course, that's entirely possible and entirely plausible, because that's the American way of dealing with this. With each successive generation, it either, by your own choice, becomes something that you hold on to more tightly, or becomes entirely incidental. Will Latinos follow that trajectory? Or will the existence of fusion and univision? There was no univision for, in Yiddish for the readers of the Daily Forward. But there was the Yiddish theater. There's the Yiddish theater. Find one now. Uh, it yes, just, here's one. It didn't make it. Yes, right. on Second Avenue. Yeah. But it didn't make it. Uh, there, was no, there was no Telemundo for the, uh, the readers of uh, Il Progresso Italo Americano in, in New York, which was a daily newspaper then became a weekly newspaper, then became a monthly newspaper, and now has two pages in Italian in it. Uh, you know, that's, we think of that as OK. We think of it as desirable. We don't expect people at the parade in Bay Ridge in Brooklyn on Norwegian, whatever it is, whether it's their independence from Sweden or whatever it is they're celebrating. We don't think of it as, you know, oh, boy. You guys aren't really Norwegian because you don't speak Norwegian. But there's a lot of that that goes on in, inside the Latino community where someone's whitewash or they're faking it or, or whatever. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next 20 years, whether, um, whether it'll become uh, cool in 50 years the way it is now to say you're part Cherokee. Uh, you know, there's like 80 million Cherokees in the country. Uh, whether it'll be cool someday uh, to, uh, to pick out, or whether, like a kid in my troop, we were in a very tense neighborhood in Brooklyn that was not easily integrating, and there was me and my brothers, and there were the Vasquez kids, and Greg Hernandez joins the troop, and we said to each other, oh boy, Greg Hernandez joined the troop. So we go over and say, Hernandez, 
we sort of s smoke him out. We gotta smoke him out. And he says, I'm not Spanish. Ooh. <laughs> well, it turns out there's like one male line great grandparent who came from Cuba, and everybody else was Italian. So Greg Hernandez says, hey, because he's he obviously been asked this question before from the, from the tense, uh, the, the tension around the answer. He's obviously been asked before. He says, I'm not Spanish. I'm Italian. So, you know, when you hear that 130 million figure being thrown around, it either is going to mean a lot or maybe not so much. I mean, last night I was at a speech by the mayor of San Antonio, cute as a button, uh, uh, definitely a comer in national politics, Julian Castro, bright guy. Cute brother, too. Cute brother, too, looks just like him. Stanford, Harvard, mayor, mayor of the seventh largest city in the country. Just shocking that San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the country. And also the, uh, the only uh, Mexican-American majority big city in the country, too. Well, Julian Castro's grandchildren, uh, it'll either be a big deal to them or not a big deal. These are the good Castro brothers, mm. uh, the <laughs> ones that everybody likes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I suspect that the proximity to the sending countries, that our connectedness geographically, culturally, trade, commerce, might mean that this uh, disappearance of identity that is at one plausible end of the spectrum is less likely than some sort of ongoing consciousness. But um, not for me to, to say this is your show. Um, let us open this up now to you. And if you could just raise your hand. And um, when I call on you, if you could identify yourself, that would be great. Um, yes, in the orange coat. Thank you. Hi, Abigail Golden Vasquez, um, Jurican, just uh, <laughs> compl the complexities of uh, what it is to be Latino. And I was wondering if you could speak ab about that um, to a certain extent. We're talking about people who have different realities in the way that they came to this country. Some were here um, before, and so they, you know, they were the natives of this of this country. Um, some f came fleeing wars. Uh, some came, uh, were, you know, like Puerto Rico, uh, just joined the United States from one day to the next. And so, um, is there such thing as a Latino? Some speak Spanish, some don't. Um, some are here legally, some came extra legal methods. Um, so I'd like, you know, that's one of my questions. And the other, you say in your book, um, the way of the Latino is going to be a way, the way of this country. Um, and you hear that a lot in the Latino community. And so um, I'd like to speak to, to that a little bit more as well, especially because we do have some serious issues about education, literacy, schools, income inequality. Uh, right now, roughly a third of all American adults have a four-year degree or better. A tenth of all Latino adults do. And until that number is really raised significantly, uh, this is a, a threat to American affluence in the decades to come. Uh, if you, like me, are depending on a well-educated and productive workforce to pay the FICA taxes that fund your Social Security check, you have an interest, uh, even if you don't even consciously think you know a Latino. Uh, you, <laughs> you have a direct and very concrete interest in their success and continued success in the United States. So before, when the community could fail in isolation and it wouldn't really mean that much to the whole, once it's 30% of the population, it's going to mean a lot to the whole. Is there such a thing as a Latino? Well, I think you could overdo that, oh, come on, do Salvadorans and Mexicans and Cubans really have that much to say to each other stuff. And I think it's largely generational, too. When I was a kid, uh, something like eight or nine out of 10 Puerto Ricans in the United States were in the five counties of New York City. Now that's simply no longer the case. Puerto Ricans were, the, by a vast amount, the majority Latino population in New York. Now they are the plurality 
Latino population in New York, and by the next census, they may not even be that. There were no big cities where there were large numbers of Latinos from different places, large enough numbers to matter. Then Chicago came along and became the first place where there were lots of several different things, but now there are lots of Chicago's. The largest feeder population in Houston is not Mexican, it's Central American. The largest new population in South Florida is not Caribbean, it's Central American. So now we know each other in a different way. Uh, I used to, when I travel around the country, I knew when I turned on the radio in South Florida, I'd hear good music, and in South Texas, I'd hear oompa bands. I've changed. I like oompa bands now. <laughs> but also, you hear what the Grammys call tropical music uh, in Southern California, which you didn't hear before. Juan Luis Guerra is the lead leader of one of the most successful Latin bands on planet Earth. The old thinking was that because Juan Luis Guerra is Dominican, he shouldn't go to Chicago or Los Angeles because there are no Dominicans in Chicago and it's all Mexican in Los Angeles, so who would buy tickets? When Juan Luis Guerra and 440 went to the Rosemont Horizon, an 18,000 seat arena just near O'Hare Field, the concert sold out in four hours. So it didn't matter, obviously, to the Mexican kids in Chicago that Juan Luis Guerra is Dominican. So don't overdo that thing, and don't think it makes you sound smart or sophisticated, uh, which is a thing that I get a lot from other people who say, oh, come on, Mexicans are different from Puerto Ricans, so uh, your book is, um, ha takes on a, a fantasy notion that they're part of the same thing. If you talk to younger people, they make very little distinction between those groups the way their parents and the way their grandparents certainly did. When my daughters, I mean, just saying this feels weird to me. My daughter rose Varsity Crew at Wilson, which is to me a, a people like us don't do that <laughs> moment. But uh, it's like my, my daughter rose Varsity Crew at Wilson <laughs> High School, and when they won, an all-region championship for their age group and got this tremendous cup and I mean next they're gonna be doing lawn bowling or croquet or something. <laughs> uh, there I had the team line up. I said, oh girls line up, blah blah blah. They stand there. One Salvadoran kid, my daughter also Jurican, uh, kid with a Cuban mother and a, and a Minnesota Swedish father, and, um, and a black American kid whose grandparents came from the South during the Great Migration. They beat all the private schools. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll set aside my satisfaction with that result for a while and, and just talk about the fact that they think of themselves and refer to themselves as Latinas. And if you said, oh, but wait a minute, she's Salvadoran and she's Cuban they wouldn't even know what you were talking about. The sociologist Alejandro Portes identified in the 60s and 70s that there was a very strong national origin identification that was significantly more important to people than this pan-national identification. I think that's definitely changed. And, you know, even in the early 60s, Celia Cruz was singing that it didn't matter if you were Mexican or Puerto Rican or, or Cuban. Uh, we're all Latinos in the 70s, in, the, uh, in our Sergeant Pepper's uh, Siembra uh, with Willie Colon and, and Ruben Blades. He sings in a song called Plastico uh, that, you know, listen up, Latino. And he was talking to everybody because uh, then he calls down the role of countries and everybody shouts presente. Uh, which is that little left-wing moment at the end. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, shh, shh. Um, so this has been an in-group conversation for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, it's finally sort of becoming less salient. Other comments, questions for Ray? Uh, in the back, yeah. Okay. You? Hi, I'm Sue. Hi, Ray. Hi. Um, had the honor of working with Ray on Talk of the Nation years ago. 
Uh, you've been talking a lot about Latino youth, and I want to talk about Anglo youth. Um, when I think about the Lou Dobbs approach to Latinos, what I hear is a lot of fear, a fear of an erosion of Anglo-dominant culture, loss of English only, cooking, every aspect. When I think of young Anglos, at least the ones I know, I don't think I hear that. They're so much more likely to be in school with Latinos, to have to admire Latinos and music and, and popular culture, do you think they're gonna all, s how do you think young Anglos are gonna change this? The, the Lou Dobbs took the low road, Samuel Huntington took the high road to the same place, uh, which was to doubt uh, that Latinos would get the hang of democracy, of being part of the civic project. Uh, I would, Huntington's no longer with us, but I would steer Lou Dobbs to what was being written in the New York Sun and the New York World in the 1870s and the 1880s, despairing of whether immigrants from the dregs of Europe would ever get the hang of democracy. Uh, we do, we'd say in the same things over again. They didn't turn out to be true the last time. I don't know why they're gonna be tr true this time. They're not gonna be. Uh, anybody who's gone to an aldermanic election on the southwest side in Chicago and watches uh, people whose grandparents are from Durango and Guanajuato duking it out on 26th Street for an aldermanic seat uh, know that it's very much now part of the civic culture, uh, just as it is in, um, in the Rio Grande Valley, just as it is in Orange County and, and uh, Inyo County and so on. I, I, or. I would have Lou Dobbs watch Sabado Gigante and have his <laughs> Mexican-American wife translate for him uh, because this is a, a program that could not be produced anywhere in Latin America. It's an American program, an American program in which not a word of English is spoken. A genial Jewish Chilean host um, in a South, Ma a South Florida studio with people from the Caribbean, native mainland born from Central and South America, speaking Spanish in a wide array of accents. Then after a game or a stunt or a talent contest, the whole studio audience sings commercial jingles for American products in Spanish, <laughs> products that are not sold in Latin America, that they only know the jingles to because they watch TV in the United States and they buy all. and. Hyde and Pepsi and all these things. Sabado Gigante is one of those reassuring moments where you think, yes, acquisition. Uh, that's something that all Americans have in common. Uh, so we'll all, we'll all warm our hands around the, the television you log and be Americans together. And uh, it's really all going to be all right because the children of those people in the Sabado Gigante studio audience uh, are all going to speak English. It's an open question whether any of their grandchildren will speak Spanish well. And their schoolmates, as you suggest, uh, will not think this is as big a deal as Lou and company do. You know, you, you, you play such a serious <coughs> anchor on television, and, but in person, you're, all, of this, all of this erudition is coming to us with such humor. I, I wonder if they'll let you be funny on Al Jazeera. <laughs> <laughs> they will. Um, this, this may come as a shock to many of you, but Jim Lehrer wasn't big on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. So I'll take you and then, and then come to you and you. Um, thanks. Uh, Ray, I'm Garrett Mitchell. Um, and I, I want to just ask a quick question that really was spurred by your uh, observation earlier about one in three Americans has a college degree, one in 10 uh, from the Latino, Latina community do, and that, it, that, 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 that needs to change. It leads me to question, um, <clears throat> um, if we look at the question of assimilation, and you've talked <coughs> earlier about the, the communities from Europe that, that came to the United States and people worried about whether they would, would assimilate, wh what, what metrics uh, are, are 
available and helpful to to allow us to get a sense of whether the Latina Latino population are assimilating in the way that they would like to and we would like to? Well, I would take a look at that college number. I'd take a look at the uh, high school graduation number, which is actually much better and getting better. Um, this last 10 years has been a disaster economically. I don't think a lot of people realize that the cumulative Latino national family budget, wealth, 50 million Latinos lost two-thirds of their net wealth in the five years from 05 to 10. Two-thirds. It's because they were heavily exposed in real estate, because they were the last people mm -hmm. to buy houses in large numbers. So they got in at the end of the boom, pushed through the front door by less than scrupulous um, lenders and, uh, and sellers. And also by the big voices in the culture that told them, oh, better get in now or else you know, you're going to miss it. You're never going to own a house. They would have been better off if they had stuffed that money underneath the mattress and just left it there. Two-thirds. They were also very heavily exposed in construction. Right. So when the housing bubble burst, they also lost their jobs in tremendous numbers so that for a while uh, unemployment was roughly twice the national average. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with self-investment. Um, certainly social scientists will tell you that what seems to you yourself to be the wisdom of investing in yourself is more evident at a time when the economy is growing. You play defense when the economy is shrinking, and you, pay, you play offense in self-investment terms if the economy is growing. So the shadow, the long tail of this economic meltdown will be with the Latino community for, for years to come. How that affects decisions that are made inside the house, whether or not to take a loan to send one of the kids to college, uh, whether or not um, a kid who might have been on the bubble. You know, the, the conversation is still had in a lot of families that girls don't need post-secondary education. So a lot of families are saying, oh, you know, we'll save up and we'll send Jose, but not Maria. Um, those will have a lot to say about how much this changes in the, in the near term. But also just general optimism. The, no, the, the numbers are very encouraging that are coming out of the big uh, center in Stanford and out of Pew Hispanic, that in spite of it all, um, optimism and a belief that uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, life will be better for their family is higher among Latinos than it is among any other Americans. Boy. America caught a break with that because if they were instead alienated, um, disengaged, pissed off, pulling back, I think it would be a bigger problem for the United States uh, to have this growing population that doesn't believe that things are going to get better for them. That would be a terrible thing. Uh, so in, f in the face of it all, that, pop that population remains optimistic forward-leaning, and, and with a really abiding belief in the future, which um, I just hope the country deserves it. And, but we have um, the gentleman here in the pink shirt, and then I'll come to you. Hi, Ray. Thanks for uh, speaking with us today. I'm walking to my from Los Angeles, California, fourth generation Mexican-American Chicano. Uh, I grew up there uh, and a former LA public school teacher. And so I was so happy and gratified to see that you included the history of the student blowouts or walkouts in your story of, of Latino Americans. And I think, uh, personally, it's such a great story about the capacity of young people to organize and fight for justice and, and literally change history. So I wonder, from your perspective, and given your, your history or your study in this history, what lessons young Latinos should draw from their history in this country to guide their future as they take increasingly significant roles in leadership? The the uh, essential message of the book is that the right things don't happen right away. Uh, that the United States has never taken at simple face value the Latino desire to be part of the American whole 
that is quite evident. I mean, if you go back to Mariano Vallejo in California, when uh, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Americans first start arriving in California in large numbers, he thought that at the beginning that this was progress, that they would bring inward investment, they would bring contacts to a more vigorous uh, and dynamic economic system, and that it would be good for the Californios, the, the Spanish-speaking uh, uh, inhabitants of the land uh, before the Mexican War. And eventually he's dispossessed, he's jailed, uh, his uh, estates are carved away through various kinds of legal chicanery and just by outright theft. And yet, through it all, he uh, maintains that there is a good future for his people and his, his descendants uh, in an American California. And again and again, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the first rebuff, the first back of the hand, uh, the first slap isn't taken as the final verdict. So whether it's Hector Garcia, uh, who comes home and sees his fellow GIs after the Second World War unable to collect their GI Bill benefits, and he starts the American GI Forum, and it becomes one of the most powerful and today most revered um, civil rights organizations uh, for Latinos in the United States. They never say, that's it, they don't want us, it's over. The fight always has another two or three chapters to play, like a good telenovela. And, uh, and eventually, you do get over. And that redeems everything that you're parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents went through. At the end, if you live long enough to see the happy ending, uh, it does make sense. And that has to happen uh, in order for future generations to feel that it was all worthwhile. I, I include in the book this really touching letter from a group of uh, Latinos in, in LA County uh, in the aftermath of the Sleepy Lagoon murder where a bunch of young Mexican-American guys were sent to life stretches and 25 to 50 stretches in state prison for a murder they obviously didn't commit. And it galvanized the community. And they wrote to Vice President Henry Wallace to ask for help. I mean, they probably thought that you know, FDR was too busy saving the world. So they would write, write to the Vice President. But it was a touching letter in its apparent belief that at the end of the story there was justice. There was no hint that they believed that these guys were lost, done, railroaded by the system, and that this was irredeemable. And I think that's, that's one of the great strengths of, of the terrible trials and the terrible sacrifices, but also some eventual uh, vindication. And, uh, if, students, if students read my book, which of course I recommend that they do, um, I think one thing that'll become crystal clear to them is that you don't win right away necessarily. It sometimes takes some time, but you do win. That is poignant. And, and, and I'll give the last question. We have to wrap up at 1.30 here, and then um, if you can take the question, and then I'll close, and, and you can go sell your book. <laughs> Art and then commerce. <laughs> uh, Betsy Griffith. Um, uh, so my question is cultural. Uh, a lot of Anglo-Americans in the 50s and 60s and 70s got their first exposure to Latino Americanos in, in their own country uh, through a collaboration by Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim, and William Shakespeare. And I'm wondering if... And Jerome Robbins. And Jerome Robbins and Arthur Lawrence. And I wonder, as having just seen this at uh, Wilson High School, I wonder if you might tell us how we should watch West Side Story today. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What a great final question. That is a great final and, question. And you can incorporate into your answer the issue of how you managed to reach Latino and Anglo audiences with this book, because it's a similar question. Um, I would humbly submit to you that if West Side Story were written today, 
I would hope that the music and dancing were as brilliant as they were. It's, it's a really a stunning piece of work, still to this day. Uh, but that I, I would hope that the racial politics of it would be a little different. I um, interviewed Rita Moreno, and she notes that all the Puerto Ricans in West Side Story are exactly the same color. Um, that it was insisted by the producers, uh, they, as actors and actresses, they were all different colors, but they went to the, the shoe polish shelf and just did the same thing for everybody, uh, which I guess in the schoolyard scenes, it made, it made it easier to pick out who was beating up who, uh, but it really, there was no interest in conveying a Puerto Rican reality to a wider audience. The, um, the class politics of West Side Story are fascinating because in a way we understand what the excuse is for people who literally just got here to feel marginalized and alienated. Well, what's the other guy's excuse? Um, they're a motley collection of various European descended ethnicities that, that end up uh, in the tenements of, of uh, the west side of Manhattan. Interestingly, West Side Story originally was conceived as East Side Story with uh, an Italian Romeo and a Jewish Juliet. Uh, but by 1960, the idea that there were tough Jewish street gangs on the east side, <laughs> uh, you know, I guess, beating you with a copy of the New York Review of Books, uh, you know, just would, uh, didn't, didn't, it didn't convey. So uh, they moved it to the west side to a neighborhood that was known in Manhattan at the time as San Juan Hill. And um, fa it's a fascinating thing. If you look at the sets, they look, wow, look at those, you know, the, the fire escapes and the crummy four-story walk-ups and all that. It's all real. It's a neighborhood that had been emptied out to be demolished in urban renewal. They moved 10,000 Puerto Rican families out of that neighborhood and just told them to go live somewhere else. And then when the movie was done shooting, they knocked it down to build Lincoln Center, where 40 years later, West Side Story would, uh, would play in revival. Uh, so Tony's um, Polish. How come he hasn't gotten over in America yet, or his parents, or Riff's parents, or anything? The, the idea that these foreigners are somehow different um, just doesn't stand up against much scrutiny, but it's, yet it's still one of the, the overarching tropes of, of the whole story. In a recent revival of West Side Story, they finally have all the Puerto Ricans talk to each other in Spanish instead of heavily accented English. And they put super titles like an opera. And I thought, well, that makes sense. Why would Anita talk to Bernardo in English? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and why would Maria talk to her parents in English when obviously, if you know anything about that time and that place, they wouldn't speak any English. Um, their parents would have been uh, pushing racks in the garment district. Uh, working in the kitchens of Midtown hotels, uh, working at a sh sewing machine all day, and unlike the Ellis Island era immigrants, who of course learned English the minute they stepped off the boat uh, and began quoting Shakespeare. Uh, in Yiddish. In y <laughs> Uh, every time, you know, I grew up in one of those neighborhoods where kids had to go with their parents to open school night. So I know what a crock it is, these stories of all these immigrants who came off the boat and immediately started speaking English to each other. Uh, but I think, I think West Side Story was the only, the, the, the sad part about West Side Story is that it's the only thing that most Americans knew about Puerto Ricans for decades afterwards. So if it had told of the struggles like the Goldbergs of a Puerto Rican family trying to make it in America, you might have had a different impression in Minot or Pier or Bismarck or Coeur d'Alene of what Puerto Ricans were like. But because West Side Story was the only impression, um, 
highly sexed, violent, and incredibly handsome was the uh, only <laughs> the only impression that was left when it was all over. And you know, two out of three, it turns out, are are wrong. Um, so. Uh, See what I did there? You really, you really coming out of your shell. <laughs> I, I think it, I, my friend Juan Gonzalez, who's a um, columnist for the New York Daily News, said for, in his first 20 years as a journalist, when he was writing stories in eastern Pennsylvania and southern New York State, um, when anybody would bother to ask where he was from, he'd say he was Puerto Rican. And the thing they would say more often than anything else is, where's your knife? <laughs> so West Side Story actually had a, had a serious impact, I think, for a long time. Um, does um, Benicio Del Toro's Oscar or Raul Julia or J-Lo or who else? You know, there's plenty of other counterexamples. Mark Anthony. Um, well, no, just, just a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago at the um, All-Star Game. Baseball's All-Star Game was in Shea Stadium this past year. Mark Anthony sings the national anthem. And the Twitterverse lights up with thousands of people tweeting their anger about why they couldn't get an American to sing the national anthem. Oh my God, OMG, WTF, why couldn't they get an American to sing the national anthem, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, yeah, they're sitting out there and the rest of the out there and thinking, who is this guy? He's not an American. It's fascinating. So it's charming because these people do live in such an incredible bubble. It was actually a couple of days later before he even realized this happened. He's at the airport. He's flying to Florida or someplace, and reporters catch up with him. And at first, he doesn't even know what they're talking about. And he says, you know, what do you mean? And then finally, somebody explains that people were tweeting that why couldn't they get an American to sing the national anthem. And he says, I was born in Spanish Harlem. And as far as I know, that's still part of the United States. <laughs> and then, almost like an afterthought, oh, and by the way, Puerto Ricans are Americans. And that's still news in 2013 to a lot of people. So there's still a lot of work to do. Well, on that note, please join me in congratulating and thanking Ray. <laughs>